you know, over the next hour. And uh, since I remember I've taken undergraduate and graduate courses in both the colonial period and the American Revolution, this will have to be a bit abbreviated, but I hope to raise at least a few themes that I, I think are useful and uh, even indispensable in understanding this period. And I would begin by noting, I don't think Professor Livingston is, uh, is here. That's a shame. Okay, that's all right. Well, because I don't know if the point that I'm going to attribute to him in fact, belongs to him. But it's a good point, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. This is Professor Livingston's point. And that is that we sometimes use the term founders, the founders of the United States, to refer to the founding generation and the, uh, the great men who so-called founded the country. But there's something misleading about this word because the, obviously the United States wasn't just you know, in an instant founded out of nothing, out of whole cloth. It obviously owes something to the colonial inheritance. And I just came across a book and I'm going to mention it to you even though you'll never find it because it's from 1897. Um, but it's a, a book that's extremely interesting on the topic of where the Constitution came from. And uh, it's a book that explores the colonial inheritance. Uh, and, and the book is by Sidney George Fisher. And it's called, this is the title. I love these 19th century titles. The Evolution of the Constitution of the United States, showing that it is a, it is a development or, um, of progressive history and not an isolated document struck off at a given time. <laughs> so in a sense, you don't even need to, need, need to read the book after you, after you hear that. But the author goes through and he goes through 29 colonial charters and constitutions, 17 revolutionary constitutions, 23 plans of union in order to derive the uh, constitution that we have now. So, in fact, if we, if we discuss you know, where uh, you know, American liberty comes from, you have to start not just with the 1780s, but, but look back into the colonial period. Now, some, some of you may be familiar with a book by David Hackett Fisher. It's enormous, eight or 900 pages, uh, called Albion Seed, Four British Folkways in America. We're almost tired of hearing about it, even though it's a great book. And just have a few sentences on that and then uh, jump right in. Uh, in Fisher's book... He argues that um, there, there is, in a sense, you can see four discrete waves of migration uh, to, uh, to the United States, and we're talking 17th and 18th centuries here. Uh, and he's talking about roughly the period from 1629 uh, through 1775 is the period that he looks at uh, most closely, beginning with the emigration of English Puritans from the east of England to Massachusetts Bay and concluding with the stirrings of revolution. Um, four distinct geographical regions of England we can, we can see. So after the Puritans, Fisher identifies uh, as a second group a small putative aristocracy and a sizable number of indentured servants originating in the south of England who made their way to Virginia. The third migration originated in the north midlands of England and Wales and terminated in the Delaware Valley uh, later in the 17th century going into the 18th. And finally, from approximately 1718 through 1775, a fourth group consisting of immigrants from the borders of North Britain and Northern Ireland made their way to the Appalachian backcountry. Now, obviously, all these groups share a number of obvious and important traits in common. They hailed from the same part of Europe, obviously. They spoke a common language. And at least in a broad sense, they all shared the same religion. Interestingly, in the Federalist Papers, Federalist Number 2, one of the few that John Jay wrote, John Jay... Uh, course, became the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Jay cited these shared common characteristics as one of the factors that made the American Union possible. So that is to say, there, the, the, the four groups had enough in common that it was at least a plausible idea to consider union. So here's John Jay speaking. He says, Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs. So you notice he's saying the exact opposite of diversity is our strength. He's saying just the opposite. Sameness is our strength. This would have been, this Orwellian uh, statement would have been completely incomprehensible to him, of course. But the notable thing about Fisher's book is that he notes, yes, there are these basic similarities, but that a lot of times what the colonies noticed about themselves was how different they were from each other. For instance, in the mid-17th century, one Puritan, speaking of Virginians, declared them, quote, 
the farthest from conscience and moral honesty of any such number together in the world. <laughs> Likewise, the Virginian William Byrd, referring to the Puritans, warned a correspondent, a watchful eye must be kept upon these foul traitors. <laughs> and the two groups, in turn, shared a dislike of the Quakers. And it reminds me, I had a, uh, my, my college roommate was a, a Mormon who went on his mission in the, uh, you know, they go for two years in the former Yugoslavia. And I thought, okay, the peoples over there don't like each other, but I'm sure they can all agree they don't like the Mormons. Good, good, you know, good luck. Have, have fun over there. But it was frequently said that the, the Society of Friends, as the Quakers were known, would, quote, pray for their fellow men one day a week and on them the other six. <laughs> Likewise, the Quakers returned the favor. And here's what I like. The Quakers, I mean, you don't know how many you know much about them. They're sort of a left-wing, in a sense, a left-wing Puritan sect. Who, the Puritans are, are people who think the Anglicans, if, I don't know if, how many of you know anything about Protestant or Christian denominations. I mean, I know about them, but that's because I'm a strange person. But, but the, the Anglicans have not decatholicized fast enough for the Puritans. The Puritans want... You know, at least, and there are other theological issues, but in the area of ritual, they want something very plain. They want the emphasis to be on the sermon and so on. Uh, the Quakers think the Puritans have not purified enough. Uh, the Quakers will have their services not even in a church, in a meeting house. And sometimes the whole meeting, no one will speak. And they would consider that satisfactory. You speak when you're moved to speak. It's very egalitarian. So for them, the Puritans are just an outrage, just, just barbaric that they would have these backward customs of a structured sort of liturgy. And even though the Quakers believed in religious toleration, the principle of religious toleration, that doesn't mean they were wimps. They believed you should be, you should be a Quaker. So before, before Pennsylvania was founded, which is where, of course, a lot of the Quakers eventually moved um, beginning in the 1680s, some of the Quakers had started to come to the colonies, in particular Rhode Island, because basically any crazed nut could move to Rhode Island and they'd leave you alone. Rhode Island was made up of people who had been thrown out of the other colonies, more or less. But, but a lot of the Quakers who were living in Rhode Island would make their way up to Massachusetts just to drive the Puritans crazy. So they would show up in, in the Puritan churches. And this all, you're going to see the relationship this has to American liberty. I'm not just playing to the crowd here. But they would show up in Puritan churches and heckle the ministers and disrupt the services and... On occasion, some of them were known to walk naked up and down the church aisles to rile these people up about their dogmatic religion and the need to... And you can just imagine these sort of staid Puritans wondering, who the hell are these damn people, right? <laughs> so, the, the, uh, so in Massachusetts, they didn't know what to do with these people. And by the late uh, 1650s, very reluctantly, the Puritans uh, in Massachusetts actually by one vote uh, passed uh, the, the death penalty for Quakers who came up and were disruptive. And they, were, they reluctantly did this. Because they, well, the problem is they kept making the penalty worse and worse, but that made the Quakers come in greater and greater numbers. They were seeking martyrdom. So they, you know, they, I remember they cut off people's ears and they would still come back. And so finally they, they, they went with the death penalty. And my favorite story is of Mary Dyer from, from Rhode Island who went up there. She went up to Massachusetts several times. They kept throwing her out, get out of here, get out of here. Well, uh, one of the times she was up there, she was with two male companions. I mean, this is, look, I don't know what the circumstances were, but she's with her two male companions, and, and she's causing problems. So they sent, the Massachusetts authorities sentenced her and the companions to death. So they're led to the scaffold. Her two male companions are executed in front of her, and now it is her turn. And again, they beg her, you know, please, just leave and we won't, we won't kill you. They were very uncomfortable executing a woman. Just get out of here. She said, no, 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 I must stay here and protest this unjust law against the Quakers. Well, they finally said, all right, look, we just, just get out of here. They just pushed her out. They literally threw her out. Get out. And then she came back again and finally they said, all right, this time we have to execute her. Unbelievable. So, so this, is, this is the situation that, that, uh, that they're faced with. The, the fact is they just don't care for each other a lot of times in the colonies. Uh, as late as 1795, one Quaker referred to New England in general as the flock of Cain. So what I'm getting at with all this is that the fact that they don't like each other is actually very fortuitous because it means, as one of the points that Fisher later makes in his book, he didn't make all of these peculiar points, but one of the points that he makes in his book is that when it comes time to make a constitution, nobody wants the Quakers to have any authority over them or, the, or, or New England or anything else. So, in fact, you get a fairly laissez-faire approach in, in various um, areas of life. For example, 
Very often we, we hear about at the Constitutional Convention, there's a struggle between the small states and the large states. Fisher says, yeah, that's moderately interesting, but what's also interesting is the, the competing regional cultures that are at work, all these different cultures that are sometimes mutually antagonistic, how, how are they dealt with? So when we look, for instance, at the First Amendment, and I promise I won't, I won't be treading upon um, Professor Livingston's Constitution talk, but the First Amendment is uh, written in deceptively simple language. And yet, says Fisher, it entails a regional compromise of the highest complexity. Because on the one hand, you want to preserve the religious liberty of Virginia and of Pennsylvania, but at the same time, New England is not going to let you encroach upon their established churches. So what position does the Constitution take? None whatsoever. Make up your own decisions. We're not going to impose uniformity on you. So in a sense, precisely because of the mutual antagonism, the differences, the response of the Constitution is silence. And so, so that's, that's why I say that their mutual dislike, uh, to know them is to hate them, to, to, uh, to quote an eminent Austrian economist, uh, it is, was in fact fortuitous. Now obviously there's much more than mutual antagonism uh, going on here that exp accounts for um, American liberty. There is the fact that the American colonists did not see themselves as having some kind of a, 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 a utopian task of, of remaking the whole world and uh, they, they didn't, uh, they, 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 were, they were immensely practical men. Now it's true, you can cite uh, a few people to the contrary, uh, that's, that's true. But when you compare the Americans to the French, the French revolutionaries, for instance, the Americans are not going to establish a new calendar, uh, a brand new calendar, well, let's date everything from the year one when we first started, I don't know, executing Quakers or something, we'll start the calendar then, I mean, it just wouldn't have occurred to them to, to do that. And um, pr Professor Rako mentioned that I've got this collection uh, of writings of Rufus Choate coming out, nobody knows who he is, He's a, um, he was a... Um, Daniel Webster clone in Massachusetts. And, uh, but Rufus Choate it was a mid-19th century observer who wrote about the colonial period. And he looked back at it and he said, here's something very noteworthy about the colonial period. So I have this passage from Choate. There was another great work which they, meaning the colonists, had to do. And that was to estab establish their system of colonial government, to frame their code of internal law, and to administer the vast and perplexing political business of the colonies in their novel and trying relations to England through the whole colonial age. Of all their labors, this was the grandest, the most intellectual, the best calculated to fit them for independence. Consider how much patient thought, how much observation of man and life, how much sagacity, how much communication of mind with mind, how many general councils, plots, and marshalling of affairs, how much slow accumulation, how much careful transmission of wisdom that labor demanded. And what a school of civil capacity this must have proved to them who partook in it. Hence, I think, the sober, rational, and practical views and conduct which distinguished even the first fervid years of the revolutionary age. How little giddiness, rant, and foolery do you see there? No riotous and shouting processions, no grand festivals of the goddess of reason. I wonder what he's talking about there. Um, no impious dream of human perfectibility, uh, no unloosing of the hoarded up passions of ages from the restraints of law, order, morality, and religion, and then he becomes frank, such as shamed and frightened away the newborn liberty of revolutionary France. Hence, our victories of peace were more brilliant, more beneficial than our victories of war. So they were practical people. Now, it's true, you read the Puritans, and John Winthrop uses the biblical city on a hill analogy. I always love listening to neoconservatives who say, as Ronald Reagan said, we are a city on a hill. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, he said that. Anyway, when he, when he says that, he doesn't mean we're a city on a hill, then we're going to run around the world and, you know, hillify the rest of the world. It was the, 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 the purpose of the city on a hill analogy was imagery was to say that we will be visible to the rest of the world. They can see our example of how what a, what a peaceful uh, social order we have and pros prosperity we have when we follow the Bible in the way that, that uh, we think we think right. It, it, it was not meant to be something that would would be a uh, an image an imperialistic image. But of course, later when the, the later generations of Puritans had lost their faith. And all they had were the slogans, uh, like John Dewey. You know, John Dewey is raised in a uh, 
typical Protestant church, and he loves the bake sales and the dances, but in the picnics, but he doesn't believe in God. So he, but he wants to keep having the picnics and the bake sales and everything else. But they, so those people use this kind of Puritan language in a way that it was not intended uh, to be used. Okay, I have to say some nice things about Massachusetts. I come from there. Now, it's true. I'm not saying you would want to necessarily you want to have lived in Massachusetts in the 17th century. Um, you might get thrown out. They would throw you out if you didn't conform to, uh, if you lived in New England town. And they weren't going to go into your home and ask about the inner workings of your conscience. That was, that was private. But um, in, in Massachusetts, of course, I'm not, I'm not, you know about this, but I mean, obviously it was theo- somewhat theocratic. Uh, it, uh, in order to be able to vote, not that voting is everything, but you had to be a church member. In order to be a church member, you had to be, in effect, interviewed by about seven what were called pillars of the church. And they would sit you down and ask you questions. And they would want to know about your conversion experience. And they would want to know, you know, and if this seemed persuasive to them, and it seemed to them as if you were one of the elect God had chosen to go to heaven then you would become a church member. Even if you didn't get chosen to be a church member, you still had to go to church because that might be just the thing for you would be sort of their, their, their take on it. So that's true. Um, but on the other hand, and, and there was something sort of utopian about their little communities. For instance, the Dedham, Dedham Massachusetts, still, still in existence, their covenant, part of what, they, part of what the, their covenant said was that we shall by all means labor to keep off from us all such as are contrary-minded and receive only such unto us as may probably be of one heart with us. So we're not going to go out of our way to find people who cause trouble so we can throw them out. The idea is that we would have a community that would be of one mind. And I, I, I happen to think that much as I'm, uh, I'm not sympathetic to this form of uh, Protestantism, I think a lot of what John Winthrop wrote about his vision of the community is, is r- rather beautiful. So, you know, throw me in jail or something. Anyway, but on the other hand, there is, so we all know about this community aspect of New England life and that sometimes it could be stifling and that, yes, they would throw Roger Williams out or whatever. Um, But on the other hand, we should take, for instance, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, 1641, is, is a significant document that shows that, on the other hand, there was a concern for individual rights and for limitation of, of state power. What's notable about this is that long t- the longtime governor of Massachusetts Bay was John Winthrop. And uh, Winthrop's view was that there should be as little written law as possible because he thought the less written law there is, the more discretion he and his judges will have in applying the Bible into particular cases. So that meant, now John Winthrop was you know, a reasonable person, but that meant you had to trust John Winthrop quite a lot and, and his judges. And much as people of Massachusetts obviously respected him, they kept voting him back in, they voted him out temporarily because they, they realized this, is a, this discretion is simply too great. We would like to have some kind of a written uh, description of what, what our rights are. And so you get the Massachusetts Body of Liberties. Now, there are, about a, there are over 100 provisions of the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, and they include items that are familiar to the student of British law and politics. So in the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, there are things like no taxation without representation, the right to a jury trial, the guarantee that no person would be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It also contains a a sort of peculiar provision prohibiting wife beating, excepting when the husband is acting in self-defense, interestingly. (laughs) Kind of an odd thing to, to, to mention. Now, um, in, in, uh, Jack, Jack Green is one of the great uh, uh, colonial historians. has a book called Pursuits of Happiness in which he argues that if you look at the colonies, there's a sort of a continuum um, with some of them on one side beginning as very community-oriented community and other ones being uh, much more individualistic. So, for instance, New England in its first several generations would fall in the first, on the first, uh, first category because that was a self-consciously family-oriented migration. It wasn't just a bunch of single guys moving to Massachusetts. These were families who moved there, and they had strong community identity and, and so on and so forth. Whereas on the other hand, you had colonies like Virginia, which I'll say a few things about in a second, that start off just the opposite. That did start off mainly as single men 
just a bunch of single men going to Virginia. And as you can probably expect, that worked out just great the first generation or so. No, no problems there. Only half of them died. But, um, and, and the thing is that, that because Virginia, the first generation or so, there was disease and it was miserable and, and martial law, uh, that, it, it, um, that meant that it wasn't that attractive for families. Let's all move to the death trap in the Chesapeake. <laughs> But what, what Green notes is that, yeah, so you've got these two, you've got this continuum with, with community-based and, and, and uh, I don't want to say communitarian because I just hate that word. But on the other hand, you've got a more individualistic type of colony with Virginia. But he notes that over time, in a sense, these things begin to converge. So in Massachusetts, where you started off with a situation in which uh, church leaders had a lot of authority in the community and it was very community-oriented, on the other hand, the pressures of a growing population mean that people can't always live in that town center. They've got to live further and further away. It's harder to keep an eye on them after a while. What is, you know, Goody Thompson doing over that? You know, we don't know. They're living so far away. Uh, and also theological liberalism in Massachusetts will eventually uh, take root. So Massachusetts, which was this very cohesive uh, co community type, type colony, is going to begin to dissipate in a certain way, whereas on the other hand, Virginia that had started off sort of like this, as it becomes prosperous and they realize that tobacco seems like a you know, great source of prosperity, people begin to move there, it becomes more cohesive, more settled, and you get uh, a, a, um, a kind of an aristocracy there that is very, very committed to self-government and local liberties. So, and in fact, the, in Virginia, they are so, they are so dedicated to their local, and they, every time they speak about my country, of course, they mean, they mean Virginia. Uh, they're so committed to this that, for instance, the House of Burgesses, the Legislative Assembly, which was the first representative assembly, uh, um, which was established in 1619, in the House of Burgesses in Virginia, it was actually a law that you, if you were a member of the House of Burgesses, you, every member had to be present, especially for the opening session. So it was a kind of a, a sense that um, we have a special responsibility toward, toward the people and toward our, our local area. And I always mention poor James Bray. In, in 1691, the House of Burgesses was so offended by his explanation for his absence that an, uh, a warrant for his arrest was actually issued and he was held in custody until he made an apology because he was not there the first time. So this, this you know, is a, a kind of an anecdotal way of, of illustrating the attachment that the Virginians had to their, to, to their locality. And that's, that's worth noting. Even Daniel Borston, who's sort of a neoconish type historian, has this to say about them. And this is very important. When he says they, he's talking about the Virginians. Their localism has been given far too little attention and too little credit in these days, when states' rights are out of fashion, we are too often told that a man's preoccupation with the habits of the place where he lives can only drag the national progress. We are fortunate that 18th century Virginians thought differently. Their concern with the special requirements of their own particular place on earth not only flavored their political life and expectations, it also gave all their thinking the aroma of the specific and kept all their social ideals within finite bounds. So again, uh, the, the utopian sentiment is nowhere to be found that tends to be so mischievous. So therefore, what, what I'm getting is that the colonies succeeded on the one hand in providing the individual liberty that makes a rational and civilized life possible, while at the same time cultivating a, a, a corporate sentiment that provided a source of resistance to centralizing and consolidationist schemes. Remember Professor Livingston's point about the tendency of the modern state to want to flatten out all of these things. Well, it was not easy to flatten these things out. Uh, I would just mention very quickly the classical liberal Benjamin Constant, a great, great figure, had this to say about the importance of the kind of local institutions that were being built up in the colonies. The interests and memories which are born of local customs contain a germ of resistance which authority suffers only with regret and which it hastens to eradicate. With individuals, it has its way more easily. It rolls its enormous weight over them effortlessly, as over sand. The French revolutionaries, of course, despised the local customs and particularities that dotted their country's landscape and reorganized France into arbitrary departments that bore no relation to its historic regions. In our own century, 
the deliberate and coordinated destruction of local institutions and intermediary associations has been a principal weapon of various totalitarian systems in eliminating potential sources of resistance. Hitler, of course, despised German federalism, which he correctly perceived as an obstacle to his consolidation of power. Stalin, for his part, attempted to starve Ukraine into submission when standard Soviet propaganda proved insufficient to divest it of its traditional national feeling. In the soft totalitarianism of social democracy, we have seen how our own government has abetted social upheavals at the local level in order to strengthen its control everywhere. I'll have more to say about that later in the week. Um, okay, there are a million other things. We're going to move on. Let's see. Oh, I think I'm doing okay on time. I'm doing all right. Okay, good. Okay. In fact, now's a good time for some water. All right. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, I'm ready. Um, the, the, another theme to note about all this that relates to the building up of local institutions is that from the beginning we see the colonies uh, being extremely suspicious of any kind of confederation right from the beginning. Uh, I can think of three examples off the top of my head because I've you know, sort of given a similar talk before sort of why it's on the top of my head but I can give three examples of confederations that uh, that were entered into or were or were not entered into and that, that reveals something about the Americans at this time, how suspicious they were about, you know, would their rights be taken away from them if they entered into a confederation for, for, some, uh, for, for some good purpose. So, for instance, it was, it was only belatedly that the Puritans entered into uh, an intercolonial alliance, the so-called Confederation of New England, uh, persistent rumors of Indian hostilities and, and ongoing suspicions of the Narragansett tribe in particular led the colonies to consider uh, this move. And yet in the classic American tradition, the colonists kept a close watch on this confederation. Uh, so for instance, uh, New England had lived without incident uh, for some years in increasing proximity to New Netherland. But when in 1652 Cromwell attacked the Netherlands and the two mother countries were thus at war, the possibility of a colonial clash with each side arming its Indian allies worried New Englanders. And Connecticut and New Haven began to beat the drums for war and said this is what the Confederation of New England was made for to, uh, to, to go and, and prevent these things from happening. And yet it was at this moment that Massachusetts, who was a member of the Confederation, stood up and questioned the right of the Confederation to declare offensive war. This was not the understanding that we had. And they absolutely, in a sense, used an early form of nullification, said we're not going to obey uh, this, this, this um, plan of the Confederation to launch a, a, a preventive war. So, so right away, uh, we, you see a colony wa keeping watch over a Confederation, rising up against it, refusing to go along, and, and, and containing that great American spirit that is still so present in our population today. <laughs> I was being sarcastic. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, that's from The Simpsons, actually. But I'll give you that story later. Um, likewise, uh, also, there's another, another, another example, the Dominion of New England. Now, this was a confederation that was imposed on the, 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 uh, the colonies, uh, partly in an effort to make sure that British trade regulations would be enforced um, uh, more effectively, and partly out of a concern supposedly for the, the colony's defense against uh, New France, King James II in the 1680s established the Dominion of New England. So he took Massachusetts and Maine and New Hampshire and then later other colonies, um, uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York and others, and, and formed them into one government with one uh, royally appointed governor. Now this was obviously people didn't take kindly to this. What, what are you doing? You're just going to take our local institutions and throw them in the garbage so that we can all... And, and plus, making New York and, and you know, New Jersey be in the same, the same organization, this is just not going to fly with anybody. And nobody wants to be in an organization with, with Rhode Island uh, either because they're a bunch of... Uh, the colonial view of Rhode Island the whole time was they were a bunch of freaks to stay away from them. They were called Rogue Island. When they didn't send any, when they didn't send any representatives to the Constitutional Convention, people were happy. Well, good. We, it was just only... We were just being polite and we... But, but anyway, so, so James II established uh, this, this Dominion of New England, and the, the colonists were just waiting for an opportunity to smash this thing. And in particular, it would have been difficult to keep them merged into this one royal government for very long, even in the best of circumstances. But it was Sir Edmund Andros who was sent over to be the royal governor of this, this new dominion. And, and of course, as you can hear from what I, what I said, it included much more than 
what is today known as New England. Um, Andros, for instance, uh, just would just levy taxes just by his own fiat, and, and if you protested this, he'd throw you in jail, and that, that grates on people after a while. You, know, you can't, really, can't really keep doing that. And after the Glorious Revolution, and you know, of course it takes, there are no fax machines, so it takes a while for the colonies to find out what, what's happened. There's a new, completely new uh, regime in England. Um, they get word in Boston that the new king and queen, you know, William and Mary, wanted all magistrates who have been unjustly turned out to resume their former employment. You know, you know, that is to say, you know, allow the colonies to reestablish their governments. Uh, as Borston puts it, the machine-like precision with which this parallel revolution unrolled points to careful plans and leadership which no one has yet unearthed. The townspeople rose, the countryside rose, Andros and some of his principal counselors were thrown into jail. A meeting presided over by the last governor under the Bay Colony Charter adopted the Declaration of the Gentlemen, Merchants, and Inhabitants that had been drawn up by Cotton Mather, and the dominion was at an end, and self-rule was again in effect. It was this same spirit that led the colonists to reject Benjamin Franklin's proposed Albany Plan of Union in 1754. By the way, obviously all of you should own uh, Murray Rothbard's Conceived in Liberty Collection, four volumes. I remember I've been nagging Jeff Tucker for years. You know, I'd love to see this thing get put back into print. You know, I'm, I'm marking up the library copy, and I, I didn't really feel that guilty about that because, but, but because uh, I had to use it, and it's it's so useful. And I, you had, I mean, just imagine reading Murray Rothbard on colonial America. It's just he finds all the evil people and exposes them. He's the only historian who who understands monetary history in the colonial period. All the other historians say, well, according to everyone, there was a shortage of shortage of species, so therefore they needed paper money. You just think, well, I'm pleading with you people. Uh, and also, the, one of the great things is his portrayal of Benjamin Franklin. He's withering. Murphy's withering on Benjamin Franklin. He's a big jerk. He goes along with all these, all these uh, uh, British. Uh, you know, he he recommends to one of his friends, "Oh, you should become a stamp tax agent." What is wrong with you? <laughs> or, or he's in favor of paper money inflation because it turns out, well, his print shop is going to get the contract for the money. What a classic Rothbardian find that fact is. You know, man, we knew it was a conspiracy all along. Well, anyway, Benjamin Franklin, under the pressure of Indian War helped to draw up a scheme according to which the colonies would yield a considerable amount of their authority to a new intercolonial governing structure. How many colonial assemblies ratified this plan? Zero. So there is that spirit again. To heck with your confederations. We're concerned about them. We, we, we think they're a threat to our liberty. So this is why I, I would argue that it's sort of misleading to say the, traditional, the tradition of American liberty, you just start with the Constitution, you move forward. In fact, the, you know, of course, we all know the Constitution probably a step back, step away. You know, I, I, uh, I'm a two, I have seven different hats on the Constitution, depending on what, you know, where I am. If I'm talking to Hillary Clinton, I'm, I'm very pro-Constitution. But, but uh, when I'm with this crowd, you know, ah, throw it out. Who needs it? <laughs> anyway. Um, at the time of the framing of the Constitution, which sort of brings up, that's about the boundary of my talk, uh, and the formation of, a, of an allegedly more perfect union, the colonists had precedents for challenging the powers of a confederation, as in the case of the Confederation of New England, for rejecting a confederation, as in the case of the Albany Plan of Union, and for bringing down a confederation by force, as in the case of the Dominion of New England. So it can hardly be surprising, therefore, that at the time... Uh, to, to learn that at the time of the ratification of the Constitution, three states, Virginia, New York, and Rhode Island, in acceding to the new confederation, explicitly reserved the right to withdraw from the new union. Uh, and and Virgi as Virginia said, whensoever the same shall be perverted to her injury or oppression. Apparently that hasn't happened yet in New York. They, they love it, I guess, or something. I don't know. But in so doing, they were only exercising the vigilance and libertarian principle that had animated the American experience during the colonial period. So what we see from the colonial period and the basic lesson it has to teach us is that really the, the, the classic American sentiment <coughs> is not Andrew Jackson's famous toast, our federal union, it must be preserved, but John C. Calhoun's beautiful reply, the union next to our liberties, most dear. 
Now, that might sound like a nice way to end. Boy, that's really dramatic, but I've got 70, 78 other things to say, so I'm going to move on. It, was, it would have been a great ending, but, but <laughs> now I have to talk about, it was the ending, I think, for, for something else that I did, but now we have to talk about things having to do with the revolution. Now, obviously, the revolution, good. I think I got, I don't know, 17 minutes, and I got to leave some time for questions, so a few themes that might be useful when looking at the revolution. Um, and then the question is, is it a revolution? Is it just a war for independence? Was it radical? Was it conservative? Uh, I'll give a few thoughts on this. I think for me, the most impressive thing when you study the years leading up to the colonists' decision to make the break with Britain is the level of sophistication of some of, of, some of their arguments. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, but they're dealing with very profound issues in many cases. So, for instance, 1761, and this is long before people had thought about making a break with England, but we all remember about James Otis talking about the general writs of assistance, which were, in a sense, search warrants that you could get uh, with practically no evidence and just barge into people's homes to check to see if they're smuggling. And James Otis stood up and, and, and uh, spoke out against this, uh, the renewal of, of, the, of the writs of assistance. And... And, and this, this is sort of significant. The, 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 the colonists were totally against the writs of assistance, partly because they were completely guilty. I mean, they're all smuggling. They're smuggling like there's no tomorrow. So, of course, they don't want somebody to come into my home. I got all the, you know, whatever I'm not supposed to have. Um, there's that. But also there is the, the fairly sophisticated argument that Otis is making is, it has to do with what does it mean uh, for something to be constitutional when you don't have a written document, as, of course, the British don't have an unwritten constitution. Is something constitutional simply because Parliament says it is, hence legal positivism, or does it have to conform to some accumulated uh, set of traditions and, and common practices and customs? And that the latter position, of course, was, was the American one. Uh, and, but, of course, Parliament would often say, well, you know, we approved it. What, where's, the, where's the room for argument? Where's the, the further need for argument? This, this is a very interesting issue. And Otis is not, uh, is not successful. But this is the type of thing that Sam Adams, who's sort of the poor man's James Otis, can, can popularize issues like this and explain them to ordinary people. Now, today, I think it would take about, you know, like three hours to explain this idea to, to, to people. But, but at the time, people read, they're interested in things, they discuss things in taverns, uh, and so on. Uh, another, another thing is, for instance, 1764, the, the American Revenue Act, sometimes known as the Sugar Act. Now, this, th there are many reasons that Americans might have been against this act. And I don't have time to go into all of them, but in, in Murray Rothbard's book, there's fantastic treatment of this, of this particular act. But I would just note, note one thing. We all know, and I think it was uh, Dr. Higgs who pointed this out in the first talk, that the British had imposed a series of trade regulations uh, that would pertain to colonial trade for the purpose of enriching the mother country, frankly. And what's notable is that in principle, you don't really see the colonists in principle opposing that. In practice, they oppose it. They just smuggle and they just ignore it. But in principle, they say the, the British government has the authority to regulate the trade in, on behalf of the good, the good of, the, of the mother country. In principle, that's, that is, that's basically their position. Now, in this American Revenue Act, uh, what, one of the, uh, another thing you also know is that for a long time, a lot of these regulations had just not been enforced very well. They just looked the other way and so on. Well, one of the things we see in this American Revenue Act is that up till now, there had been an absolutely prohibitive tariff on molasses from the French and Dutch West Indies. You get your molasses from the British West Indies, and you obviously see uh, why, they would, why they would do that. Well, as a result, of, in 1764, the American Revenue Act actually lowered the tariff on, on um, foreign molasses considerably, and yet the colonists were furious at this. Now, this is something, you know, you, you just think, uh, most people would just wonder, why would you be upset about lowering a tariff? But notice the, the principle that's involved here. Nobody paid the tariff when it was a, a million percent. I mean, nobody paid a 100% tariff. Nobody was paying that. And, and it was not really bringing in revenue. In fact, the, when the British trade regulations, it cost them, up till about 1764, it was costing the British government on the order of four times as much to enforce the trade regulations as they got in revenues from the tariffs collected. So it wasn't meant to be a source of revenue for the British government. But if you lower the tariff, it might make it 
possible or reasonable for some people to pay that tariff, to purchase the formal assets and pay the tariff, and therefore be, become a source of revenue for the British government. So suddenly now, it seems like it's a nice thing. They're playing nice. They're lowering the tariff. But in fact, it's a sneaky way of engaging in taxation without representation. Now, that's, a gr you know, that's great. What a sophisticated argument that is. Um, in, in my opinion. And again, it's something that you think would just whoosh, over most people's head. As far as I can see, the tariff is lower. <coughs> and that's what you know, Tom Brokaw says is lower. So I guess... Uh, I always tell my students to rile them up that, you know, this, and I don't single them out, but I say the American population today is exactly the type of people King George III would love to have dealt with. <laughs> they do as little as possible. They don't learn anything. They speak in slogans that, you know, on bumper stickers or in the newspaper. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, I mean, I could just imagine King George III coming up with a slogan, the king is your friend. And then going up to people and saying, oh my gosh, look at what they're doing. Yeah, but the king is our friend. Oh, oh gosh. Anyway. anyway, 1767, one more example. The, um, what do you call them, the Townshend Acts had to do, well, had a, several things involved with them, but uh, in this case, you've got ta uh, tariffs imposed on, on lead, paper, paint, glass, and tea. Now, obviously, the items themselves are not that significant, but what is significant is, all right, you've got another taxation issue and there are issues related to that, but what were... They go, the British going to do with the revenue they got from, from these particular taxes was of even greater significance. Because up till now, um, man, many of the colonies had royal governors, royally appointed governors. That was the way that England could keep a kind of a, a hand in, in, these, in these governments. But the colonial legislatures retained the right to pay the governor's salary. So if the governor got out of line, you would just threaten not to pay his salary. And you'd be amazed at how quickly they would turn around on issues like this. Well, the towns, the perfect, one of the things that's going to be done with these uh, tariffs is that we'd take the, the British would take the revenue and pay the governor's salaries with it. So that the one restraint that remained to the colonists would be uh, violently destroyed. And now they would have really no control over these governors. Now, th these are, you know, th this isn't just, well, they raised some taxes and the colonies didn't like it. Okay, that's true. That's 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 true. But but all these issues are, are you know they show really good functioning minds and and these are these are issues that were being popularized for ordinary people uh, and 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 yet in, in in each case and this is where I think I maybe I differ a little bit from from Murray Rothbard and I hate to do this because I but in this case there's always this question of is the American Revolution a radical event or a conservative event because you get the Russell Kirks of the world and you know I'm sure he has his fine qualities Russell Kirk but it seems like every book I don't know if this is being recorded or not but I, who cares every book is the same thing you know like uh, can't have liberty without order okay I got you and, and, and they would say that uh, it was conservative because well actually let's hold that off the, uh, there was another argument that the American Revolution was actually rather radical and some of the things you might cite in this regard were the fact that um, by percentage of the population, there were actually, in a sense, more emigres in, in the American Revolution than in the French one. You know, people who just had to flee to get out. Uh, people were British loyalists and so on. Uh, and that, that indicates a certain spirit of radicalism. But notice in, in, in each of the cases that I've mentioned here, and I didn't just pick these because they work. All the cases basically follow this model. What are the colonists really upset about? They're upset that in each case, the British are guilty of an innovation. The colonists are the ones who want to continue along the traditional path of self-government, of the traditional rights of Englishmen. And in each case, this is the way at least they, they portray it, the British are guilty of doing something new, of, of engaging in innovation. That's very different. I think that, that, that's why I, indic I tend to think that it is a, a conservative event in the best sense of the word conservative, conserve good things. These rights that they had were good things. Uh, th that's uh, that's why I, I, I come down on this on this on this side of things because on the other hand, if you look at the French Revolution, that's just innovation after innovation after innovation, and there's no logical stopping point. You can always keep innovating, whereas the the American Revolution, when it's over, it's over, you know. And that's that's um, anyway. That's that's my my take on all this. The final thing I would I would note, and and the thing, and the more I read Murray Rothbard's take on this, the more I think this may just be a semantic. Some of this is just a semantic difference. 
But I want to say, I think I've got a, a little, just a few more minutes. We started a few minutes late, and I know we want to stay on schedule, so that's fine. But that's very kind of you, sir. I appreciate that. Okay, I want to just put a couple things on. I haven't used this whiteboard once, and let's, let's, let's use that. Yeah, it's a crying shame, ain't it? But there's one more point I want to make, and this, plus this will be a, a beautiful segue into Professor Livingston's talk, I, I assume. And that is this. I want to just show very, very uh, ridiculously briefly... Um, one, one more point, how the colonial period and the, the revolutionary years can be brought to bear to settle a very, very important historical dispute that has, that has gone on since probably the 1830s. Now, I don't know, again, what the relative level of knowledge is here. Some of you may be experts on this. Some of you may never have heard about this before. But really beginning about the 1830s, in a systematic way, you start to see two different schools of thought trying to explain what is the nature of the American Union. Uh, you have what might be referred to as a nationalist school, and you have what might be referred to as a compact school. So here we go. Put them on the board. Okay. Okay. And basically, the question that comes up here is: When the United States becomes the United States, uh, when the Constitution is formed, beyond and even even before the Constitution. What do we have on our hands here? Do we have a single people taken in the aggregate, the American people, and they founded the United States, and it's one and indivisible? Or do we have a, a series of independent states coming together to form a confederation? That's these people. Now, it's, it's true. If you look in the, in the, um, um, in the Constitution, um, well, it, it's true that you can see the words, you can see the words we the people. And, and do ordain and establish and it looks like well the people of the United States did it so I guess these people win the nationalist people by the way that argument totally doesn't work it's the only argument they have and it totally doesn't work but you can ask me about that later uh, da, da, da. these people who are these people who are the guilty parties Ugh, oh, ho, 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 ho. from Massachusetts my home that's so love. Everything's named after Daniel Webster, Massachusetts. Take the Daniel Webster Highway and then pass the Daniel Webster Liberty Tree and then turn right on the. <laughs> then there's um, Joseph Story, great jurist. <laughs> He's telling kind of a story. And finally, dun, 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 dun. oh. <sighs> now I don't know how you people feel about Lincoln, but. <laughs> That's a, supposed to be a skull and crossbones. I don't know. All right. Just give me a few moments, and if you have a question, I'll, I'll try to take one question at the end, or you can see me after. Okay. On the other hand, you've got great people. You're totally thrilled to be siding with them. Yeah, Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah. All right. Especially like in the Kentucky resolutions. All right. That's great. Uh, then you've got uh, Calhoun. Great figure. Extremely interesting. Thought-provoking. Right. Lovely figure. Who's it? Well, sort of an obscure one, but I like him. Um, a guy named Abel Upshur, who was great Virginian, who, among other things, he was Secretary of War under Tyler. And he wrote a great book that needs to be reprinted uh, in 1840. And it had another one of these 19th century titles, you know, a, a Brief Inquiry into the True Nature and Character of Our Federal Government, being an examination of Joseph... Anyway, <laughs> the basic gist of this is that these people are saying that... that I mean, you see what the consequences are of holding either of the theories. I, I give this as my paper assignment to my kiddies. I say to them, uh, you, I, I give them a speech from Calhoun, a speech from Webster, and I say, what are their competing views of the union, and why does this matter? What are the consequences of these? What are the practical consequences of what might seem a fairly obscure uh, uh, issue of political theory? And the answer is this. Obviously, if you view the... the, uh, the United States as being uh, a compact among states, then you're much more likely, it makes much more logical sense to support things like nullification, which is an issue I don't have time to get into, or secession. Because, for instance, Lincoln, who holds this other view that it's just one big unbreakable whole, for Lincoln, secession is just an arbitrary, states are just sort of arbitrary lines around an arbitrary group of people. And so if a state secedes, Lincoln sees this as treason of one part of an unbreakable whole breaking away, whereas these people see this as the supreme act of, of sovereignty, of, of a sovereign state withdrawing from a confederation that it joined. 
Well, throughout the whole colonial period, now obviously you can go into much more depth about this, but the whole colonial period totally vindicates these people. It completely vindicates them. Story, in his book on the subject, goes completely overboard and says that the Americans have been one people since the colonial period. They've been one people, just one people. Well, let me just read very quickly, very, very quickly, uh, just a little bit from Abel Upshur, who, who just puts this, buries this, this argument where it belongs. He says this, look, the colonial governments were clothed with the sovereign power of making laws and of enforcing obedience to them from their own people. The people of one colony owed no allegiance to the government of any other colony and were not bound by its laws. The colonies had no common legislature, no common treasury, no common military power, no common judiciary. The people of one colony were not liable to pay taxes to any other, nor to bear arms in its defense. They had no right to vote in its elections, etc., 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 etc. And there's just so many more things that it is. And he goes on and on and on. Uh, so for instance, suppose there had been one colony that had not gone along with the Declaration of Independence. Would the other colonies, does anybody think the other colonies would have had the right to coerce that colony because, hey, you're one people with us. You've got to join with us against the British. You know, no one, no one uh, says that. Now, the, the other colonies may well have viewed that one as their enemy, but they would have had no right to accuse it of, of treason. That colony would have been in the same position as Canada in the midst of this, uh, uh, in, in the midst of all this. Uh, and there are so many arguments that these folks make, but none of them work. And, and the, the final thing I would just note very quickly is uh, the... the um, um, even the, 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 the Continental Congress, which during the, the Revolutionary War, there was a, a kind of a national government, sort of, but it was something that was, it was established for practical purposes, had no authority to force the states to do anything, uh, depended on the subsequent ratification of its, of its acts on the states, uh, and that is sometimes cited as well. They were one people. They had this, they had this government. Well... The, the colonies, nevertheless, were, were engaging in acts of sovereignty all this time. Ticonderoga was taken by the troops of Connecticut before the Declaration of Independence. Massachusetts and Connecticut fitted out armed vessels to cruise against those of England uh, in 1775. South Carolina followed their example. And even in treaties and everything, especially in the provisional articles with Great Britain in 1782 by which our independence was acknowledged, proceeded upon this same idea, and this is my final point, his Britannic Majesty acknowledges the said United States, to wit, New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, and lists them all, to be, uh, each to be a free, sovereign, and independent state. So the, 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 uh, the British acknowledge that they were dealing with the common agent of 13 independent sovereignties. There is no mystical... Because all these people have to rely on is, is emotion and mysticism. Oh, we've always been all one people, all one people. But then you actually bring law to them, and that, that's just seen as being uh, 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 very pedestrian. How could you actually give us legal arguments? We've all been one people. This is all crazy stuff, and it, it has a lot to do with, I think, the artificiality that Professor Livingston talked about when he talked about the modern state. You have these people to thank for that. I wish I, I, I hadn't, didn't have to rush through this so much, but I think I've already gone over a minute. I'm sorry, I don't know what happens to me. I'll take one less minute in the next time. But what happens here? Do I take, um, do I take questions? Because we did start about five minutes late. You only get five minutes. Uh, pardon me? Take two questions. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, yes, sir. Okay, uh, except in passing, you didn't mention much about the Declaration of Independence nor natural law uh, and uh, how, how much this helped shape the uh, future nation. Hmm. Well, I guess I sort of thought that Professor Bassani has been talking about it. And, I, and you know, I, honestly, it didn't even occur to me because I thought I had so much to cover. Uh, and, and the Declaration, the various ways that people have interpreted it. It didn't occur to, occur to Arthur Schlesinger either. Yeah, 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 well, you know, <laughs> surprise. But, but uh, P Professor uh, Higgs was telling me uh, earlier that there are a couple of very interesting books that have just come out. One of them is on uh, it's a series of essays on... on um, kind of an intellectual exploration of the Declaration. I can't remember the... Maybe he can tell us about that later. But, uh, I mean, off the top of my head, it's, uh, it, it's hard to give a quick answer because there's been so much controversy over it uh, that people were talking about it in the um, 19th century. What did it mean? The South thought that it didn't mean what liberals thought it meant. and It's a, it's a complicated issue, but I happen to discuss it over drinks or, or, or something. I saw this guy first. Yes? Um, you were talking about the radical versus conservative argument. Perhaps one of the reasons that the revolution might appear radical or people would like to come in, which is so radical to the mainstream of the state that it's not made a profession today. Even 
what's conservative then rather than that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It may be that they, they use that terminology because this, I was saying this to somebody the other night, the, the, the kinds of things the colonists did during the revolution are just utterly, fun. they're objecting to taxation, objecting to, think, to, to certain things that, you know, we just accept without, without a, a peep of anything. And yeah, that would seem pretty foreign and radical uh, uh, to them, but that's a great that's a great kind of radicalism. But I think I'm only able to take two questions, and I'm sorry for going over, but you know we started a little late. Thank you. Thank you.